Hi, good evening, everybody. Hope you can hear me out there. We'll just wait a few seconds for people to um, join us. Then we'll make a start with our open clock club. Right, I think we are all systems go. For new people this week, my name is Matthew Reed, and I'm co-author of this book that you can see in front of you. And uh, we're joined this evening by the other author who you'll hear from later, John. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, this is our third open uh, clock club, and the broad intent of it is to support people who are um, beginnings who are particularly interested in uh, in new beginners. I think we've just got a couple of people waiting. And um, welcome to uh, people who just joined us. So the the purpose of Open Clock Club is to support uh, beginners in clock making. Um, I if you can go back and look at the videos we made. Um, last week and the week before. Uh, there's a whole sort of background to the story of why we were motivated to write this book in the first place. So before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. The first one is that this session will be split into three. We'll have a couple of um, short comfort breaks uh, uh, in about, we'll have the first one in about 15 minutes. And this week is bring a, a beginner or a young person along um, so we uh, have Frankie with us, uh, who is, uh, I think, a young person, and he's going to talk about his first experience of uh, fixing a clock. And then we're going to talk to John, who's in the clock repairing business, and he's going to talk about his kind of route into clock making and why he chose to do the stuff he does. And hopefully this will be interesting to people right at the beginning because of course, when you first start, it can be completely overwhelming. And there are many routes, whether you work as a repairer, a maker, a dealer, in industry, in uh, conservation, whatever. So we're going to begin to look at where this, where this thing might take you. Um, if you want to uh, join in the chat, please keep your microphone muted. You can either put your hand up by clicking in the participants toolbar thing, or even better, please join in the live chat. We've found that the live chat on these events is really cool and then my team is here uh, helping out and they'll respond. Anything we don't get to during the session, we'll answer during the week on social media, or we'll try and tackle it in next week's session. And to that end, we've had two questions this week which we will try and address at the end of this session once we've heard from our guest speakers. And those two questions are, one, how much oil is enough oil? Really great, a good old nerdy question. And the beginners there might actually say, what are you talking about? What's oil and what kind of oil do we use and all that kind of stuff. I'm duty bound to say it's all described in our new book, of course, but we'll try and answer that question of how much oil is enough oil. Many of us are used to kind of pouring oil in a car engine or putting oil on a bike chain. And of course, clocks are completely different from that. The um, other question is uh, relating to mainsprings, which is kind of the hot controversial subject, can you believe it, on, uh, on social media during the week, which uh, again, team, uh, team how to repair pendulum clocks is dealing with and that is how long should a clock run and I think the question actually relates to the more sort of um, difficult subject of what happens when the mainspring no longer does its job of powering the clock for as long as the maker might have um, might have intended so I'll just check that we've got nobody waiting to be Admitted. So we'll get round to those questions a bit later on. Today, uh, first though, we're going to hear from our two guest speakers. And the first one is Frankie, who's going to talk for 10 minutes or so about what his first experience of clock repair was. So 
I'll hand over to Frankie. Thank you. Um, just keep an eye out for people in the DMs. So, hi everybody. Um, uh, my name's Frankie and I am Matthew's son. So, what I'm going to talk about today is really just uh, a beginner and how to, uh, and what my first experience working with the box was like. And it really isn't as biased as you think because I was asked to do this as a um, as an honest review and it was a long time, it was actually quite a while ago now that I uh, did this anyway. So, and also the help I got was only really when uh, someone else would have looked it up as if I was to ask my, uh, to ask my dad, anyway. And also with the tool situation, uh, I can appreciate that um, a lot of people wouldn't have the opportunity, um, wouldn't have the options I have available. I do have about 40 drawers in front of me for absolutely full of tools if I ever needed anything. So I am quite spoiled for options in that department. Anyway, so when you're beginning any, any hobby, just in general or anything, it's really easy to kind of get deterred from wanting to try it. Anyway, so this really doesn't happen if you are to follow the book through because it gives you all the requirements you need and it gives you all the tools that you need to complete the project successfully to a good degree. Anyway, um, even though I've grown up around clocks my entire life, I've had hundreds in my house from when I was younger, I never really picked up any, a lot of it from that, which, uh, so it really was like starting just completely exactly from the beginning in this situation. So when beginning, I, I follow quite a lot of tutorials and things just online. And a lot of it I find that is, it presumes that you know something already. And it really isn't uh, in this book. Anyway, because it, it, everything's labeled and it does start right from the beginning. So you don't have to find any parts on your own and everything's labeled. So you do know what everything is whilst you're going through. So when I, when I first started going through and taking the clock apart, when I first started taking the clock apart, um, there were some basic techniques that really did kind of, that I really did struggle with at first. But at, what I found was, as you went through it, these techniques really repeated themselves quite a bit, such as unclipping little things from the arbors to take them apart. Take them apart. And, so anyway, after getting through the first 10 pages or so, I think it was, it really did start to become kind of a lot more fluid to me and it started to become just a lot easier and I really started to enjoy it and I was able to learn from it and it did feel like I was actually accomplishing something because as I was taking them apart, once I got those skills out of the way, I was able to look at how the gear train worked and actually start to learn so taking apart, taking apart the clock, it really kind of stood out to me as something, probably the easiest part of it, in all fairness, because once you've learned those basic techniques and took the both of the plates off each side of the clock, it was, um, it was just like taking them out and putting them down and just being really careful with them. And you can have a look at them and you can get a, quite a basic knowledge of, of how they worked. So um, just before I go any further, the clock that I um, the clock that I worked on was actually a two train, so it had two separate um, mainsprings. Although it really wasn't any different to um, one with just one, I thought with just one. So and once I had took everything apart, it was really when I I thought I had quite a basic knowledge of it, as I had seen and just looked and played with all the parts, and yeah through all the parts. So about, I think it was about 10 pages into the project. Um, so it was the next step, which was cleaning. So although it really isn't my favorite part, it did, uh, it was good to learn because it did let me see the parts a bit closer. And it's really important to know how to do that because once you learn those really boring and basic skills, it'll be so much easier in the future and you'll be able to complete that type of thing just a lot classic, a lot quicker. 
and it, it was quite tedious, but it really didn't bother me as much as uh, you'd think. So after cleaning, I think we were about two days into the project when um, we began to reassemble on the final day, I think it was. And this was probably one of the parts I most struggled with. And, and this was because when you're putting it back together, everything has a very specific part it has to go into and there needs to be enough movement between the gears for it all to run smoothly for a long time. Um, as well as this, there was oiling, which was something which took me a while to get uh, used to because I do quite a, a, lot, a lot of work on bikes and it's really, it's quite different and it's really not uh, what I was used to. So uh, this was also probably when I learned the most at this part because as I was going through quite slowly, trying to be uh, careful with what I did, I, I really started to see how everything fit together in the, um, how everything fit together in the gear train and how everything worked. So I think that's when my, my knowledge really uh, expanded most. So the next step after this, we, we actually, me and my dad, I didn't do this on my own. We took apart the main springs to clean them. Um, and although this was quite, uh, quite difficult, and at one point I did almost take my fingers off because I wasn't quite holding the spring right, uh, because we had the right safety thing, because we had the right safety things on, and I had a tea towel covering it, my, we were okay, although it was uh, quite a bit of a surprise. So, I think one of the most, one of the parts I struggled with most as a beginner was just being really careful um, whilst getting the parts kind of back together because it really does have to be more precise. And the patience, I, I really just didn't quite have as a, the patience I just really didn't have as a beginner. And I, so once we kind of got it back together, the, um, we actually repainted our, uh, our case for our clock, which was quite good. And we made our own custom pendulum out of, out of a piece of metal, which was quite enjoying. And it, it was cool to see that you could put your own kind of spin on what you're creating and what you're trying to, what you're trying to fix and make work. So I, I think really some of my final thoughts as a beginner were that you have to be, you have to be prepared. And I think a lot of people may, may rush into it a little bit and trying to get on with it straight away. But I, I can promise you if, you, if you wait and you get these tools and you make sure you have everything and are well prepared, it'll make it a lot more enjoyable and it will make it a lot easier for you. And your work will just flow a lot better and it will be a lot smoother. So, and I do think kind of following the book is a good idea because when you are, um, where, because when you are following the book, you're following just one or two people's techniques and therefore everything's really the same. Uh, everything's really the same and, you're, and you won't skip any parts. So, although, I did struggle uh, for quite a lot of the way, which was really most of the mainsprings and putting it back together, which was quite a finicky part. Uh, I do actually look forward to doing it next time because I'm sure I'll learn quite a bit more from that. And it'll go a lot uh, smoother due to the practice I've had. And I guess one of the last things is that health and safety is really extremely important. I was actually quite surprised when I first started it how much I actually had to do, especially when we got to the main springs and I actually saw the power that was stored up inside of them. There was, um, as I've already said, they, we did have an, a bit of an accident and the main spring did uh, come out of my grip, but we, we had enough safety gear and we had glasses, gloves, and we had a tea towel covering it. So nothing bad did happen. And I think it's really, really important that you have that so nothing happens as well as just having somebody with you at that part. Cool, yeah. Thank you, Frankie. Any questions? That's good. Uh, and if you have any uh, questions, you can put them in the comments about uh, my first experience or anything you'd like to know. So, Frankie, did the clock run when you... Yeah, so um, the clock did run. Uh, 
Oh, the, the one problem that I did have and I did struggle with was realigning the hands with the um, realigning the hands with the striking mechanism because you have to in the book it tells you to draw this down to get the right angles and I'm not sure if it's because I missed something or if I just was a little bit off anyway um, I did get some help from my dad but it was cool to see what I had kind of done wrong and what to do differently. And I'm sorry that the question is buggy. Do you think um, working with these parts has kind of helped with any other sort of mechanical? So the only really other thing I do work on, which is uh, somewhat mechanical, it is my bikes. I'm really um, interested in that. And it did give me quite a, quite a good understanding of, uh, of the gears, I think, was probably the most relatable part between the two, and the cleaning, and just how you know, important that really is. I'll just check with any more questions. Thank you. Okay, cool. Anyway, uh, thank you for listening. And uh, I do appreciate that um, a lot of you aren't beginners and that this, this may not have been the most uh, exciting thing to listen to. But uh, it's, really, it's really good, Frankie. Thank you. Anyway, thank you. I'll Cheers. see you later. Thanks, Frankie. We're going to take uh, a break for a few minutes now. Uh, we had a um, couple of people who couldn't get in at the beginning. I don't quite know why that was. We'll obviously try and um, uh, sort that out for next week. But if you are trying to get in or you're in the waiting room, then please bear with us. And this recording will go on our YouTube channel so you can hopefully catch up there. Um, just before we go for our break, one thing that came from Frankie there was that idea, and uh, in my sort of professional life, I'm a conservator, so we're kind of slightly obsessed about uh, not changing um, the object. And uh, what was interesting to him as a young person was, oh great, we've got people joining. Uh, what was interesting to him as a beginner was that opportunity to actually uh, change or repaint the cases we did in this instance which is kind of uh, slightly professionally difficult for me, but I can see that that's really interesting to a whole lot of other people. So maybe we can discuss that at um, some later date, what that means. Let's say, for instance, if you get one of these mid 20th century mantle clocks and you want to paint the case, you often see this stuff on the internet. Uh, uh, for me, that's quite sort of difficult, but, uh, and it's quite controversial, but I can see that it really makes the whole thing more attractive to some uh, beginners. So we will take a couple of minutes break now and I'll see you back at 20 past when we'll be with John. Thank you.
Hi, welcome back everybody and uh, part two of um, Open Book Club, Open Clock Club even, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we're going to be joined by John who's uh, co-author of the book here. So please again, in, keep the live chat going, that's really important um, that we have that kind of participation. Um, just before John starts, um, before I forget, because I'll forget at the end, I want to tell you about the, ne the next two Open Clock Clubs that we've got. Uh, next week is Q&A, so it's over to you guys, uh, either now or during the week through social media, um, I admit somebody, uh, to send us those questions, please. We want to, it's com thrown completely open, as long as it fit for a public consumption, um, it's going to be over to you. So the sooner you can send the questions, the more time we have to think about them and prepare. So we'll be led by what you want to talk about next week. So get your questions coming in. If you're already got sort of associates in the NAWCC or something, please ask them and we will do what we can. The week after that, we're going to be running through this book, uh, doing a kind of live demo, but also it's Christmas quiz week and there'll be a super exciting prize to win for the winner. And the last thing I've got to say for John Starts is, do you remember last week we gave away those lovely vintage pliers? Well, they are on their way to California to a new home. So all good. So over to you, please, John. Evening. Um, I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about um, uh, how I got into the clock making business and um, this is really aimed at the beginners um, but um, it's kind of since I've started to this evening it's occurred to me that it would probably be a good idea if you've got any questions that you want to know the answers to about how to get into business if you um, type you know just type in your questions I can just about um, talk and read at the same time <clears throat> so I should be able to keep up with that but um, I'll just run through I've got a list of um, topics I'll, I'll just want to cover quite quickly the reason I got into clock making was I used to be a teacher and my wife um, decided that I needed a change of career I don't, I don't quite know um, <laughs> what what it was she, she why she thought that but I'm sure she had her reasons and um, she suggested I, I went to West Dean. And um, so I spent two years uh, studying with Matthew as my teacher. The first year, I, I, the courses have ch changed their names sorry, a bit. John. Yeah. Uh, will you just explain what West Dean is to- um, Oh, sorry, yeah, what? yeah. West Dean, um, it's, well, actually, can you explain what West Dean is? <laughs> <laughs> I can explain what West Dean is. West Dean is uh, one of very few now um, international, recognized clock training programs basically it's a college in the south east i think you would call it of england and it specializes in historic craft practice like blacksmithing um book conservation um furniture uh, repair and clock making and when i make when i say clock making i mean clock making all the students start by making their own clock which maybe john will tell you about sometime and then they go on to carry out some conservation uh, restoration so um, look it up West Dean uh, in Sussex in England and of course there are programs in the states and in, on the continent as well. So in my first year uh, with Matthew I, I did the um, diploma which was um, a course um, which was a course to kind of introduce me to the basics a lot of I'm, I'm not just saying this to push the book but a lot of the kind of stuff that's covered in this book and the kind of seeds of this book were really I used to complain to Matthew that there was no proper documentation um, so um, this is kind of how it's, this this whole project's grown up in my second year I did something called the professional development diploma <clears throat> which was a course where you a year where you kind of decided what you wanted to do and I thought well I want to get into business and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start doing um, some some general repairs really as uh, there were other things involved in it but um, it was a uh, it was a really good year and during that year my wife very kindly um, in fact I'll move on to this she kindly had uh, our garage converted into a workshop a clock workshop so um, obviously 
I'm sad that I haven't got the garage anymore, but um, it's a really nice clockwork shop. Um, and um, kind of thing I would say about that is she spent quite a lot of money on that. So, for example, I, I must have one of the few garages in the Chichester area that's actually got a skirting board around the walls. But you don't have to go that far. Um, you know, you don't it really. What do you need in a workshop? It needs to be bright, you know, well illuminated. It's, I think... Uh, um, it should be reasonably warm. Matthew is not such a believer in that side of things as much as myself, but... Um, you have um, to um, respect, uh, respect health and safety, John, so storage of chemicals, extraction, and remember that your practice um, impacts on other people around you again. That's the one thing I would say about any studio or workspace. Mm, yeah, sorry, yeah. I mean... Um, yeah, that's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. Um, and indeed, I'm reason I'm probably not as good as Matthew would like me to be in that respect. But uh, it's uh, it's a reasonably safe environment, I would say. But then it's only me that's in there, to be honest. So um, it's um, it's only myself I'm going to harm. Um, other things that so I had a workshop right from the start. Um, this is say ten years ago now, and um, I. Um, I started advertising. The only adverts I do, I, I, I have or pay for, are in local parish magazines. So I'm very, very much the sort of local village clockmaker, as well as local village idiot, it has to be said. And um, uh, I find that I've had work, I, I, it's been non-stop really since, since, um, since the day, first day. I, I could do much more work than I do, um, but um, I don't, you know, I don't spend all my time doing it, you know, so I try to sort of limit my days in the workshop to about three days a week. Um, I, it, Matthew, I mean, I don't, Matthew won't mind me saying this, he's in a kind of different league to, to me because um, I'm never going to get um, somebody through my adverts contacting me from a museum and saying, you know, will you do this um, work for the National Trust or something like that. But, you know, it's what suits me, really, and um, I, I'm quite happy doing that. So, sorry, John, um, yeah. can I just ask you about that, that point? How do you get work at those adverts? So what, are they on the internet or um, you oh, know, they're, how they're, do you let people know? They're just, um, they're just um, in the little magazines that come through once a month from the sort of local... Um, churches really um that's pretty much it's it's really is very much the local magazine is that i don't i don't have i mean i do have a website but i don't think anyone ever looks at it is, is that what you mean matthew i mean it's just done through magazines is that yeah i think my i think my point is that um there are many as we'll discover over the next weeks and months of running this uh open clock club is that for people who are beginning um, what I'm interested in doing is making sure that they understand that there are many ways this can go. I mean, you're a professional clock repairer, clockmaker, um, and of course it could be a hobby, well-being, social uh, function as well. Um, but we can go towards conservation, we can go towards making, we can go towards uh, re, as Frankie was kind of alluding to, sort of repurposing uh, clocks and stuff like that. So when, John, when you said um, the work you get, can you just kind of outline typically what a, um, a, a typical sort of week in the workshop looks like in mm. terms of the kind of clocks that are on the bench? Well, yeah, the kind of clocks that I largely work on are um, long case clocks, um, uh, both 30 hour and eight day. Um, I'm just trying to think what's in there at the moment. Um, got, I've got a couple of American clocks and Sonia clocks in the, in the workshop at the moment. Um, French pondule clocks, I get a lot of. Um, one thing, when I first started, and I did this against Matthew's judgment, but um, eventually I came around to his way of thinking. I did originally think that I ought to be willing to do any clock that came my way. And so I did originally try and do carriage clocks, but for me personally, um, 
it's, it's so I don't know whether it's to do with my hand skills or something it just really didn't suit me at all and it caused me a lot of stress so uh, there was for me there was a really big day once when I just came to the conclusion right the next time someone phones up and says I've got a carriage clock I'm just going to say I don't do carriage clocks and to begin with that was quite a difficult thing to do second nature now and no one ever sort of says oh that seems that no one ever seems that odd and my life's become a heck of a lot happier as a result of that so I'm not saying don't do carriage clocks I'm just saying um, I don't do carriage clocks because I'm not very good at it may I step in may I step in please John you just definitely can yeah for the begin for the um, beginners here um, a carriage clock the thing that John's talking about is a is a is a regular kind of clock but the way you'd have a pendulum in a clock like this what you have is a mechanism uh, an escapement the bit that does the ticking that's very much like a watch and i think this is quite a controversial sort of area really because and i when i started um i found this incredibly off-putting uh, this is one of the things that i really want to drive home um, because I got a lot of kind of clocky people coming up to me and saying you need to be able to repair carriage clocks and although I'd worked on watches they weren't particularly interesting to me and what I found out and a lot of people will disagree with me here is that in order to work on watches i.e carriage clocks and please let us know in the live chat if you do work on both but in my experience you need a very different kind of environment the um, as John just said, he works in a quite smart, I must say, a converted garage. I work, in, work at the moment in a studio at home. So those environments are not kind of clean room environments. And this can be incredibly injurious to watch type work. Um, we had a question last week about people saying, do we do um, case work as well? You know, the wooden cases. Uh, you can't really do casework and watches at the same time. Those two things are pretty incompatible. You need different tools. The ballistics of the components are very different. You need different oils. You need a watch cleaning machine. So this is a message, message to beginners. You can develop your practice and never touch uh, a carriage clock or a watch. So please don't let that put you off. If you want to get into that, then brilliant. And a lot of the programs like the program uh, at the uh, Birmingham City University, uh, I think in England, they start with both and then you go on to specialize in either a clocks line or a watch line. So anyway, my slightly ranty message is don't be put off by people who tell you that if you can't repair carriage clocks, then you shouldn't be repairing clocks. Um, I don't repair watches or carriage clocks anymore and um, rather, uh, you know, I've kind of done all right out of it. Sorry, John. Thank you. Uh, that's fine. No, I mean it's it's good to it's good to stress that point because it it caused me a lot of um you know a few years ago it caused me a lot of heartache um worrying what people would think if I said there were certain kinds of clock that I didn't do. But what actually happened in the event was no one batted an eyelid. So it's often it's often the way. Um, so that's uh, I, I've mentioned how I get my work. Um, one thing that you need to get, and it's, is, is insurance. You need, to, you need to get insurance for the things that you're looking after. And also um, you need, to, uh, this is typical of me, I can't remember what it's called, but the kind of insurance, what's it, uh, li unlimited, limited liability, is it called, Matthew? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really, uh, sorry to keep jumping in. Right, that's right. It's a really good question. Um, and... Again, going back to the book, and sorry, it sounds like an enormous hard sell, but in the book, we make it absolutely clear that for the beginner, only work on objects or clocks that belong to you. Then you don't get into that problem with people saying the clock isn't working. When is it going to be ready? And when you get, if you make that decision, and I know a lot of people who are um, buying this book are interested in clock repair, have got no interest in professional practice. But the minute you get into professional practice, you need two things. You need professional indemnity insurance, professional indemnity insurance. If you make a mistake or you make a, a value judgment or something happens and it's your fault, you're not going to lose your house over it. 
And secondly, you need if you go into the field, as in you go and work in people's homes or in the uh, professional environment, you also need public liability insurance as well. And if you go to something like a historic house, I've just renewed my insurance and the insurance level for that kind of thing of it. It's not massively costly. It's about £10 million here in the UK for um, your public liability. Basically, if you put a clock on the wall and it falls over and injures somebody, you're going to be fine. So really good point again. Uh, really good point again, John. Thank you. Yeah, and and um, uh, don't don't be put off by the insurance aspect to it because it really isn't difficult to get at all. Um, I I was I, I expected people to say, oh, you know, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why you can't do it because you live in the south. I don't know, but you know, it's it's, it's very rude. It's like, almost like getting car insurance. To be quite honest with you, um, the other big issue, if you do think you want to go into it, is tools which of course we've discussed to some extent um i probably like a lot of people start when they start um got a bit obsessed with acquiring tools and i probably got quite a lot of tools that i don't really need um but one thing that that matthew and myself will have to talk about eventually in one of these sessions is um is lades because if you want to get if you're going to get heavily into clock making you really do need to have a lathe of some kind or, or another. And um, I, 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 I was, in a sense, Matthew, I was thinking, you know, are we gonna, are we gonna discuss that at some later st stage? We will, we will. What I'm really conscious of is a, a lot of people out there won't know what that thing is. Oh, right. Again, when I started, and again, when I started, what happened was people started talking about this machine and that machine and six and five eighths and all that stuff, which is great. You know, we kind of love and live and breathe that stuff. But my message to the beginner is don't let that put you off, which is, again, why we wrote this book. And uh, we've really kept it to a limited range of hand tools. Um, and if you go on eBay or something or you talk to some engineering people, uh, about machine tools because it's a vast array so my message is get started uh, with something something like this book and we've had a really good question about the BHI the Horological Institute's um, uh, courses which we'll either answer after John's finished or maybe next week. Okay and um, I, 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 if anyone's probably the best thing um, for the rest of, um, I, I've kind of run out of things to say really, but um, if um, if anyone's got any specific questions they'd like to ask about getting started, I'll, 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 I'll say one thing about it. When I first started, you know, uh, there was a day when I was sitting in my workshop and I didn't have any work and I thought, is there really going to be a day when I'm, it's just going to be routine for me to be picking up people's clocks um, repairing them delivering them and actually getting money and you know it happens you know uh, it really is remarkable you s one one day you look back and think oh yeah yeah I'm I'm a clock maker now so if it can happen to me it can probably happen to anyone I would say thank you thank you John for that um that was really cool a nice insight um just on on that point uh, i don't know what the situation is again in the states but here in england and i've mentioned this before clock making is on the radcliffe list of endangered craft and i know we tend to talk about clock repairing or disassembly and reassembly and again we can discuss because those two things of course are not uh, polarized situations then they're uh, part of a continuum where you stop making parts and you actually start making an entire clock. Let's talk about that at a later disc. But the answer is, um, I can only speak for England, of course, but there is masses and masses and masses of work. There's a lot of people, the, the, the kind of, um, you know, uh, one end of the age demographic that are retiring and so on, and they're just not being replaced. So if you're thinking about this for a professional sort of income uh, vocation, there's a lot of opportunities out there. We're gonna take a little break now for a, a few minutes. And when we come back, I've got those two things to talk about, the oiling and the spring, which we could talk about for ages. 
please keep uh, the live chat going. Uh, that's really cool. Thank you for joining in. We've had two questions that I'll deal with immediately after break. One is, does this book help with the Hermela movements? These are uh, a German made um, 20th century type mechanical clock. And the other question is, what's my view on the British Horological Institute uh, program of study? Uh, so um, we will uh, discuss that when we come back. So I'll see you. Let's uh, make it. Um, well, let's have a five minute break, shall we? And we'll come back at quarter two. All right. See you then. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, to... Yes, good. <clears throat> I will uh, welcome welcome back. Um, I'm a little bit early. Uh, enthusiastic. They um, we've got loads of questions, so just rapid fire on the questions. Uh, one about what tools do I need to get started? Um, I can. Uh, John, have you got your book there? I have, yeah. Can you tell me what page it's on. Oh, well, actually, um, I've only got a copy of the... Um, right. Sorry. sorry. That's all right. We're one of the teams finding it. Uh, in the it's book... Appendix, appendix one, I think. Right. There's an appendix on the, the kind of tools we think that you might need to get started. Again, if you, um, 
the thing about the book, it's available on Kindle Unlimited. If you've got that, you can get it for free. Uh, it's on Kindle, of course. But if you can't afford to buy the book or you don't want to commit to it quite yet, then uh, drop us an email through our website, How to Repair Pendulum Clocks, and we'll send you um, uh, chapter samples. And that applies to the second question as well, which is about bushing. Um, somebody says, what about bushing? Now, again, beginners will go, what is Matthew on about? Basically, very quickly, bushing is the bearings of the clock. When they wear, you replace them. Just so, here's my uh, amazing, so there's the appendix of tools and they're all hand tools. There's no machine tools in there. There's nothing that's wildly expensive. So again, the bushing question, we can deal with, with it in one of these sessions, but if you get in touch with us through our website, send me an email and I'll send you a review copy of those uh, chapters on the basis that you send us some feedback. The, the uh, bushing debt thing, the second book, Establishing Your Practice, all being well, will be out in summer. We're working really hard on it with about 80% of the way through writing it. And that also relates to the question about Hermela movements, if that's how it's pronounced. Um, these, as I said before, are a kind of um, a 20th century uh, European uh, mechanism. And most of them are either two train, as in they tell the time and they've got striking work, or three train, they tell the time, they've got striking work and they've got chiming work. And the answer is that if you're a beginner, and this book is only based at beginners, it'll help you get started, but it won't help you with the more complex um, issues that are related to striking and chiming clocks. Book two will help you with striking clocks. Chiming clocks are gonna be book three, so we've got quite a, uh, a while to wait. But if we can help, we will. So please get in touch with us. And as I said, next week is Q and A week. So any particular question, let us know and we'll do what we can to answer. Um, well, another question is about the BHI programme. The BHI is the professional body in England, the British Horological Institute, I suppose broadly comparable with the NAWCC in the States, I don't know. And they run something called, um, Uh, a correspondence course or distance learning course. Here's my old copy of it. It's been modernized since then. And, um, and um, the BHI program is a technical horology program. Now, very, very different from what we're trying to do. I think the answer is, if you're interested in the whole gamut of horology, watches, clocks, a bit of history, um, it's a great place to start. What we don't say in this book, uh, weirdly, is how a clock works. We haven't delved into the mechanics and the physics of it because we feel that for getting people off the starting line, which is what we're interested in, that is kind of intimidating and off-putting. It's important as you progress. So what I would suggest is, Try and get some experience. Uh, I think one of the BHI's um, uh, sample of their uh, distance learning course is on the internet. So look at that and get in touch with them. They're super friendly. And it's where I began with their short courses. And, um, I, you know, I this was a long time ago, so things have changed then. Uh, I had a bit of a difficult time with the short courses. I found them very much dependent on the person that was leading the program as to how giving they were with info. Um, but this was 30 years ago. So uh, I, from what I see, they're always sold out the short courses. Just get in touch with the Institute. They're brilliant. Um, they've got a good curator. They've got a great editor and, and they're super friendly. Uh, you've kind of got nothing to lose. And maybe it's worth picking up a copy of the distance learning course on uh, eBay or something if there's a second-hand one to get a feel of um, what it's like. Another Matthew, question? Matthew, yes, sorry, John. I think you can actually, um, from their website, I think you can actually get the first lesson for that distance learning course. Well, that's, uh, 
Uh, great. And, and again, if anybody's on that programme, please let us know how you're getting on with it. Uh, and also, if there's any gaps that we can fill, we don't have any uh, particular professional sort of allegiance to the BHI. But again, we're totally happy to help if we can. Um, I haven't done the programme. I started some of it and some of my students have been through the whole three kind of modules of it. And I can reflect on that and help if I can. So in the last few minutes we have, um, I'll try and answer those other two questions that you might remember from the beginning. How much oil is enough oil? And um, the thing about the, about the spring. Oh, somebody just said, where's a good place to get clocks from? Um, well, that's again why we specifically go to this single train Smith clock because they're relatively, I say relatively inexpensive, they're about 20 to 50 pounds on eBay. And the two train one, the striking one, is actually less money and more plentiful. So it's a really good place to begin. Although um, these, a lot of clocks people are quite sniffy about these clocks. There's a, almost everything you need to know in there to get started. So, um, Time for drawing. How much oil is enough oil? So um, what do I mean by oiling in the first place? Well, here we've got our clock and I've lost my pointy stick, I'm afraid. Um, and here you can just about see there's a steel or iron um, axle, what clockmakers call an arbor, which has a reduced diameter on the end which is called a pivot. And that pivot or axle or arbor rotates within this brass frame. So I'm just gonna draw that very quickly if I can and uh, bear with me here. So, um, very basically, um, there's our, in fact, um, I'm gonna, do it a bit bigger, I'll move my camera a bit closer. Do it a bit bigger. They, here, so this is um, our iron arbor, like that, little bevel on there. So this is a cylindrical component. And here's our plate. I don't know if you can see that. So what I've drawn there in, uh, cross section for the plate are those two components. So this component here, the arbor, rotates in this component, and I'll color that in, in a nice brassy color, like that, um, in, this, uh, in this brassing. So between the two, like almost all mechanical things, uh, cars, you name it, you need some added lubrication there. Almost without exception, all clocks have added lubrication. So we put in some oil. Typically, we use two different kinds of specialist uh, clock oil. And uh, depending on how heavily loaded and fast moving the bearings are, again, it's in the book. And we do that by uh, applying a tiny a tiny drop of oil with something like this. It's a piece of wire and you can see it's kind of flattened on the end. We show you how to make this uh, in the book. And we put um, a little drop of oil here. And what happens is when you touch the oiler on the outside of the plate here, um, capillary action draws that oil into the bearing. So what we get when we apply a little bit of oil and top tip for those of you who are actually oiling clocks is always oil the bearing at the top. I mean, this may seem kind of common sense. So the oil runs into the bearing. If you, if you oil underneath and you leave a tiny oily mark on the plate, what tends to happen is the oil gravity tends to draw the oil out of the hole and it runs down the plate. So enough oil, it's, kind of a question of judgment. What happens is when you oil it, and I'll draw the oil in blue for some reason that I don't quite know why, forms 
uh, say capillary action draws the oil into the bearing and it, foil, and it forms a little meniscus. And using uh, a low bit of low power magnification, something like a headband uh, magnifier or something like this, an eyeglass, have a look at the bearing and wiggle it about a bit and you should be able to see liquid oil in there. Uh, that is enough. Now, there's a whole lot to say about this because do you put a bit more in to kind of compensate for the fact that a lot of properties, buildings are really warm and there's a lot of evaporation and spreading? And the answer is you probably don't. This is why you need to check the lubrication of a working object on a regular basis. Because all that happens is if you put more oil in, say you start to fill this thing up, uh, so the oil starts filling up like this, so you put a bit more in. This thing, by the way, here, rather, um, is called the oil sink. Kind of a depression that some clocks, but not all, have in the outside of the plate. It's not a reservoir for oil, because what happens if you start filling that up, all that eventually happens is the oil starts to run out and down the plate like this. And that actually draws what oil was in the bearing out and it runs down the plate. So it's actually self-defeating. So you want to be in that first situation where there's just a small kind of visible meniscus of oil in the bearing and no more. But you do have to keep uh, checking it because um, oil dries out, spreads evaporates uh, and so on. So hope hope that helps. Again, it's in the book. And the second question is about our favorite subject, which is springs, highly uh, sort of controversial subject. And somebody said, how long should a spring uh, run for? And I think what they meant by that is uh, what's the duration of a clock? Now, most clocks like the one in the book are called eight day clocks. Uh, some are, as John said before, called 30 hour, some are longer, but let's just talk about eight day clocks and 30 hour clocks. Um, they're called that because they're either designed to run for a day, 24 hours, or seven days a week. And the, the manufacturer or the designer adds a little bit on to mean that you don't have to actually wind the clock exactly at the same time every week. If you forget, uh, it isn't going to stop. So you've got a bit of a margin of error, a bit of contingency at the end. And yes, when the clock was made new, then uh, of course it probably ran for eight days or more. If we're looking at the um, American type clock with an open spring, that clock will actually run, and again, you, uh, people in the States will know a lot better than I do, but I think they kind of run for two or three weeks or something um, because the spring is allowed to expand. But I think the question here is what happens when the clock doesn't run for the proper period? And that's a really interesting question because a new clock and an historic clock are, as far as I'm concerned, totally different things. And what I would say is in this last minute or so is check everything else first before you replace the mainspring. Only replace the mainspring as a last resort. Check the bushing and the depthing and the escape and the oil and the cleaning and the end shake and all those things uh, that we can talk about uh, more before you replace the spring. It's so easy to think if I put a new spring on, it's like putting my foot on the gas a little bit more and the clock's gonna be fine. It won't, it might run for a short period, but if you happen to replace it with a stronger spring, then all you're gonna do is wear the clock out prematurely. And we see these masses in European English uh, type UC clocks. So we're kind of out of time on that, but if you wanna talk about it in future, Q and A for next week. And I'll leave you with this thought that when we've got our spring, we've got the diameter, three dimensions, the diameter or the outside, the width of the thing, and really importantly, the thickness or the strength as it's sometimes re referred to. And the strength of a spring is proportional to the cube of the thickness. So if you replace a spring with one that's slightly thicker or maybe even very, very, very similar, 
you could be replacing it something which is incredibly, might look the same, but its characteristics are very, very different. We're going to have to come back to this because it's a massive subject. And thank you for asking. So please, next week is all Q&A. So it's over to you guys to let us know what kinds of things you want us to try and answer. So it's a massive thank you, of course, for you for attending today. Massive thank you to the team here for doing the live chat and particularly to Frankie for um, telling us about his first experience of clock making and to John for telling us uh, about the how he got his business established and what that looks like. So books on Kindle, it'll be on Amazon next week. It's on eBay if you're in England, free postage. Please join us again next week for Q&A. Thanks very much and bye for now. Bye.